All right, we just wanted to start by thanking you all for joining us. We're excited to share our recent um, review of instructional resources as a result of um, our Montana Art Professor State Plans. RFI, which is a request for information that we sent out to curriculum vendors. And so our team has been working on this and we're super excited to share with you um, our results. And just some kind of review. I know at this point we're all Zoom pros or most of us are Zoom pros, but just some quick review um, for your help <laughs> to get us going and to keep us on track and to make our community on Zoom as cozy as possible. Please do rename yourself so that your participant name on Zoom is identifiable to others in the presentation in our Zoom room today. So that might include you know, where you're Zooming from or it might include the organization that you're with, but please have at least your, your first and last name. Also with your audio, you guys have all been automatically muted. Um, please do remain muted unless you are speaking to avoid background noise. You can always unmute yourself um, if there is, especially during question and answer time, for example, by clicking the unmute in the lower left hand corner of the Zoom call. Um, you do not have to use the audio, though, if you do not want to or if you don't have a microphone. We do have the chat available and we will be monitoring the chat. And it's a great place for you to um, ask your questions or to communicate some of your thoughts. And so please feel free to make use of that. We will certainly be posting lots of links in the chat for your convenience. Also with the video, we'd love to see your smiling faces, but we know that sometimes you need to turn your video off for whatever reason. So please feel free to do so by clicking stop video in the lower left hand corner of the Zoom call. And finally, um, we would like to remind you that you have view options in your Zoom. So if you need to adjust the size of the content on the presentation shared screen, select the view options at the top of the screen. It usually has a black and a green kind of split toolbar um, and select those view options and you can um, adjust your zoom ratio so that the top of um, your screen kind of shows what you need to see. We hope that everything is visible. Please let us know if you're having any difficulties and we will be happy to help you because we are excited to share this information today with you. And to help ground us in our purpose, we'd like to open collaboration space today with a land acknowledgement. Montana is home to 12 sovereign tribal nations, each with unique cultures, histories, governments, and traditions. As we join you today from Missoula and Helena, we acknowledge that we are on the traditional and sacred homeland of the Salish, Ponderay, Blackfeet, and Grovant people, as well as other Montana tribes who have lived, traveled through, and hunted here since time immemorial and continue to do so. Today, we recognize that this land acknowledgement is one small step toward ally, true allyship between the OPI and our sovereign tribal nations, and we commit to uplifting the voices, perspectives, and histories of the Indigenous people of this land and beyond. We honor the path established by Indigenous ancestors in caring for this place and for the generations to come. Please join me in acknowledgement. In the chat, we will be posting a couple different links if you would like to use them um, to help help you view this map in a way that is more accessible for you. Um, but all we want you to do to kind of start us off and to get our chat going is to post your name and where you're joining us from and the land that you are joining us from on whose traditional territory it is. And as you're wrapping that up, um, we just want to once again remind you that the chat is a great place for you to post any questions. We will definitely be answering them in the questions and answer section at the end of the presentation, but please feel free to use it and use it well. And at this time, I'll turn it over to my team for introductions. All right, well, good afternoon, everyone. You see our faces in um, the Brady Bunch view, and you also see our faces on the screen. I'm Cole Barto. I'm the Senior Manager with the Teaching and Learning Department at the OPI, wrapping up a 14 and a half year stint here at OPI. And prior to that, I was in Manhattan um, for 13 years as a teacher librarian and English teacher. And so i um, just happy to see old friends and, and some new faces as well. Michelle? Hey, I'm half of Cole's time and still going, so I might meet that date. Um, I've been, I taught in small schools. That's pretty much most of my experience. I'm the science instructional coordinator. I think I know most of you. Um, and I was taught middle school mostly and then went on to become a halftime principal in a small school and um, was a fifth through eighth grade classroom teacher then. 
on to you, Stephanie. Hello, um, I'm Stephanie Seigert. I'm the English Language Arts and Literacy Specialist. For those of you that don't know me, I am just coming up on my one and a half years with the OPI in this position. Um, and before this, I was at the University of Montana as a writing instructor in my graduate program. So I taught writing 101 and 102. And prior to that, I was teaching in Ronan Middle School ELA um, for five years. And then I taught also high school in Washington prior to that. Um, I've also taught with our trio Upward Bound at the University of Montana for summers, and I was an MBI facilitator and a speech and debate coach in Ronan as well. Hello, everyone. Um, thank you so much for joining us today and spending this time with us. Um, I am Sonia Whitford. I'm the Mathematics Instructional Coordinator with the OPI. I joined the OPI in September. And prior to that, I was instructional coach at the Alaska Native Cultural Charter School in Anchorage, Alaska. And prior to that, I was um, a classroom, elementary classroom teacher in Wyoming for 20 years, various locations from uh, isolated one room schools to rural, and then I say to urban, as urban as Wyoming can get, um, but various grade levels and various settings. And now I am honored to be a part of this team and to be a part of the exciting things going on in education in Montana. So with that short introduction of our team, um, I, again, want to reiterate, please uh, continue to share your information, where you are and, and who you're from in the chat. Um, but today in the short time that we have, we want to be able to share with you uh, the results of a request for information um, that we um, created and, and put out into the world last fall. Um, and to just share what those results were, the process that the team went through to evaluate the responses um, and hopefully answer some questions you might have or get some ideas from you about how to share this information with your colleagues and peers across the state. So this is a sharing time um, and it is about the request for information that we issued about instructional resources that, um, are, that can be supported by our ESSER funding. So we can go on to the next thing. So just a couple of things, some of you, uh, this, when I see the names on the screen and, and faces um, are very, very familiar with the processes um, and the background behind creating Montana's ARP ESSER state plan. So those are our state or our federal funds that are specific to mitigating the, the effects of the pandemic on teaching and learning and in our schools. And so in the Montana ARP ESSER state plan, if you look on page 30 of that document, and you'll have links to those things here, um, one of the things that the state said it would do in that plan was to um, try to identify evidence-based vendors or curricula uh, offered by those vendors that meet the tiers of evidence that are defined in the Every Student Succeeds Act. Um, it's a really important point because that helps districts as they're making decisions about purchasing curricular materials or support materials um, that they meet the requirements of the funding sources for that. So, um, like I said, we um, took that, uh, that commitment in the state plan that was approved back last summer by the Department of Education. Um, and took the next steps to create a, a request for information that was shared out through our state procurement system. So um, with that, let's go ahead and go to the next slide. Um, as I mentioned, a, a request for information, it differs from what some of you as district leaders are familiar with when you need to um, get bids to buy something. A request for information is just that. Uh, we posed uh, a, a couple of sets of circumstances and asked vendors through our state procurement system um, to respond uh, to what they had to offer that would meet the requirements that we set out. So we used our state purchasing system and in that, that request for information or RFI, 
we stated that it is being strictly sought for the purpose of gaining knowledge of services and supplies, um, including costs. And um, it was also very clear when the, this RFI was issued that we're just seeking information. We weren't going to be doing statewide contracts or individual contracts with potential vendors who responded. Um, that really is uh, the, the district's responsibility. And so um, again, this is just about gathering information. So that being said, you know, we released the request for information back um, last, or it was like the last day of August um, and that closed in October. And what we can tell you and what the team is gonna tell you a lot more about is that we received responses from five vendors. We wanna mention that only five vendors uh, responded because we know that the, those these five responses don't represent certainly all of the vendors or the, the um, publishers that some districts may already be engaging with. Um, but we got these five responses and the five responses included 26 different products. Um, and so, so again, you know, we're asking for information. And what, what the team did was to basically take all of the information and the responses from the five vendors and then evaluate them according to the two scopes that were defined in the request for information um, and how those responses either met or basically didn't meet those requirements. Again, we're pointing back to the funding requirements through ARP ESSER and wanting to provide a helpful resource um, to districts as they're making decisions, particularly you know, going into the next two school years about what supports might be purchased for you know, curriculum wise for acceleration and supplemental materials. So um, kind of in an, I wanna just check in, make sure we know an RFI is a request for information. It does not mean that the state was seeking a contract from vendors, but it did allow us the opportunity to do a very rigorous review of responses so that you would be able to have evidence to show that um, the, the different products that were offered either meet the tiers of evidence defined in ESSA um, or, um, you know, maybe, merited further investigation or maybe no investigation at all. <laughs> I'll just put it that way. So with that, um, that's kind of the overview of what we did and the, and the timeline, uh, again, you know, we put the RFI out at the end of summer and it took many months of this team, Michelle, Sonia and Stephanie to review all 26 of the offered products in those responses. So without further ado, um, I would like to give the rest of the time to the team to really show you what they did and what they found as a result of this request for information. So Sonia, I believe you are up next. Thank you, Cole. So I'm just going to quickly go through a little bit of our review team process. And in order to do that, I'm going to share with you um, the rubric that we used uh, to support that review process. And this rubric was developed based on um, the request for information and those components that were included in that request for information. Um, so, I assume you're seeing this uh, rubric now. So as Cole mentioned, the request for information was broken down into two scopes, with the first scope being looking for evidence-based digital supplemental programs. And the second scope was looking for comprehensive school year programs um, complete core programs with targeted acceleration using evidence-based instructional materials and services. So this rubric was developed to support our review process. And um, if you look at just the left side, that those are the rubric items. And I'll tell you a little bit more about what's on the right side. But within each of those scopes, uh, 
So this is scope one. Within each one, they were divided into four sections, with the first section being criteria. And that would be those curricular components that are important for either supplemental in scope one or core complete comprehensive core programs in scope two. And then the second uh, section within each of these scopes deals with professional development and possible um, aspects of professional development that a vendor might provide. Then the next section, and Colet referred to this uh, when she was giving you some of the background. These are those program requirements. Um, and I'll just mention, because I'm flipping through this kind of quickly, Michelle is going to show you two specific examples of what this looked like with um, particular programs. So you'll get to see this more specifically, and then you also have those links. But these are uh, program requirements. And then the fourth section is preferred program features. So scope one has these four sections and scope two has the same four sections. So as we dove in and, and were looking at the programs using the rubric, we discovered that some of these rubric items had more than one aspect to them. And we wanted to be sure that when we we're looking at the programs, we were honoring each aspect that was embedded in this rubric item. And we also wanted to be sure that we were being very consistent across the different members of the team in our scoring of you know what exactly is this rubric item looking for and um, so just that objectivity consistency and honoring all aspects of what this rubric item might be looking for we came together and came up with look fors and that's along this right column so you'll see for each of these rubric items there is a bulleted list of look fors so that allowed us to really hone in on certain aspects of that rubric item and score the program based on those look fors um, so for example this one had three look fors then any rubric item that addressed acceleration we came together and we had a discussion around if I were a classroom teacher or a school, what would I need a curriculum a program to offer, whether it be supplemental or a complete program, what would I need that program to offer in order to implement um, an acceleration model. So that's how we came up with the look fors. And that those look fors in regards to an acceleration model look different for a supplemental program or down here within scope two for a comprehensive curriculum. So you're, these are look fors that um, address that aspect of acceleration. And you'll notice for scope two, because it is looking at a complete program, there are many more look fors within each of these rubric items. But this allowed us to individually look at each program and score each of the look fors and in that way address each of the rubric items. And then we came together often for discussions to really get that consistency and make sure that we were all on the same page. And then um, Michelle is going to go into how this would look as far as scoring each of the programs and then how that looks when we compile all of that information together. I guess that's my cue. Stephanie, can you pull the slide deck? Can you go forward one? Okay, so um, first I wanted to take you through our final, um, basically our show you the final table that we created from these reviews and then kind of go backwards because I think it'll make more sense that way. Um, but please feel free to unmute yourself and ask questions if you have any. Okay, can everyone see that clearly? Thumbs up, thank you. Um, so this is our summary. 
And we made it clear in this summary that um, we didn't have access to the full product itself. We had the information that the vendors provided us. We checked for um, ed reports and what works clearinghouse. And we checked to see if they were on IMS Global, all for different components that were requested in the RFI. So that's what where we took our information from to score these. So the final document looks like this. So on the left-hand side, you'll see that the vendor is Achieve and vendor supplied for supplemental, which is scope one, these three products. These are the grade levels they're for and the subjects they're for, and this is the total points received and then the percentage that is. The reason I wanted to show you this first is because this isn't like a slam dunk. Oh yeah, that's great. I'm gonna go get that one. Um, because, and then, then I'll take you into two examples. Um, did, did the screen change to scope to ingenuity? Great, all right. So this one received a higher score. And this one, when we went to learn zillion illustrative math for high school and for middle school, it was reviewed on Ed Reports. This is a quote of what Ed Reports said. I believe this one was all green, which is as good as you can get with Ed Reports. Um, but there is a little disclaimer here, the K-5 portion was not on Ed Reports. So this is what Ed Reports showed us was six through 12. So you can kind of get a glimpse of how this was, well, you can't say yay for the whole thing. So that's why it's kind of um, important. I'll pop back to this. All these are links to the documents I'm showing you. So um, I'm looking at the Edgenuity one in scope two, which is the comprehensive one. Um, and so this one will, so the link to this is in that final document. And Stephanie will go over with you on where this will all be available when it's done. You look pained, Kim. <laughs> Okay, so um, Sonia told you a little bit about the um, look for document so we could break these down so that they were we were doing it all consistently through every review. So here's an example of how we scored that. So this was on the RFI. This is what the vendor had to meet. For us to score it, to meet this, it would need to be comprehensive, standard aligned, customizable for the teacher, um, interoperability for student information systems, and then it would be Montana standards aligned, and then it would integrate with existing supplemental products. That's Montana asking for the best. Um, so each one of these look fors became a point item. So this one had available six and it only received four out of six. And that would be because specifically we could not identify if they were Montana standard aligned with the Indian Ed embedded, but it is customizable. So that made available for the teacher, hopefully to do that on their own. And then undetermined um, to integrate with existing supplemental or supplemental products because it wasn't stated in the vendor response. So, we could not identify that. And then another part reasoning for looking at these individual ones, I'm gonna take you down to, this is a crucial piece that evidence of innovation per practices per ESSA are there. That means it has ed reports. So this one is the evidence of a third party review through what works clearinghouse. So this program, even though it was on Ed Reports as great, there was not evidence in what works clearinghouse that showed that it had a tier placement in ESSA. So for that, for the that reasoning, we had to mark this as zero out of one to be consistent throughout. So that 
That doesn't mean that if somebody did the digging on all of the research that was done, that it wouldn't be placed. And that's kind of why I'm walking through these with you so that you can see that even though we scored this one pretty high um, and the, it may have evidence of ESSA, if you were to do some digging, we did not find it on What Works Clearinghouse, which was our, where, where we looked for that. Um, what other piece did I wanna show you? The other part with the uh, IMS Global was in preferred, I believe. Nope program requirements. Hope I'm not making you dizzy. I'm trying to scroll, scroll slowly. Um, this is, nope. I don't know off the top of my head where that is. Oh, here it is. There's not a link on this one. Okay, so evidence that they're with um, IMS Global and they had to have a cert certification on that piece that showed that they could work with school programs. Um, this one did. So it did meet. It got the one out of one. I'm going to show you HMH, Science Dimensions, Middle School. So this one also had an Ed Reports review, and this is the quote. It was only partial. On that. So when it's partial, it changed a lot of scores because the partial piece on this one was it didn't meet standards. Well, that affects very many pieces of this. Um, so, and it was not listed on What Works Clearinghouse, um, and it was not identified as an IMS. And this is at the top of every review and on the final it's marked. Um, what else did I want to show you on here? Oh, I'll take you down to the tiers. And if you have any questions, please just speak up because I know this is a lot. I mean, we've worked with these for months, so it just pops into my head, but I might not be, be being clear for you. Um, so this one also, since it wasn't in what works, says there's no evidence. Oh, and I want, I know what I wanted to talk about is because it wasn't um, identified that it matched the standards, it really got dinged on this one worth six. So because it was not standard aligned. So that takes it, takes off Montana standard aligned and it takes off, um, well, and it's iffy and comprehensive if you think about it. So um, this one got a one out of six. So I have shown you one that was really got higher marks and when they got lower marks. And I'll just kind of scroll through this quickly so you can kind of see that out of 30, these are the all the little identifiers from the look for which gave this 30. The supplemental had 30 points and the um, comprehensive was out of 50 points. Are there any questions on that? Uh, Stephanie's going to take or take over on where you can find all of these things. Awesome! Thank you so much, Michelle. Um, we recognize that it's one of those things where we've been knee deep in this for months, and so it, it looks very familiar to us, and that it can sometimes look a little overwhelming when you're seeing all of these different columns and all of these different components of an RFI that we've then translated into a rubric that we've used to score and then provided you with a copy of that rubric based on our look force. Um, and so I guess the next thing that I want to kind of talk about is like how this relates to you all, like how, how can this be utilized by you and let's kind of bring it back down to what you guys know, because I know you're all coming at this with a wealth of information about using and selecting curriculum. Um, so what does all of this mean for our local education agencies who are tasked with reviewing and selecting high quality curriculum and programs that meet ESSA tiers of evidence at their local and specifically dealing with their local learning needs? We know that our curriculum consortiums are always looking at high quality curriculum um, and seeing whether they meet the needs of their local constituents. We know that our education partners are also very, very interested in what curriculum is being used in our schools and how these curriculum choices are being made and how people are, are 
um, evaluating curricular materials. And our hope is that this review process will serve um, your local curriculum selection committees in several ways. The first is that LEAs will be able to look at our assessment of the 26 products from the five vendors who responded to the RFA and see for themselves if any of those programs meet the unique needs of their students. And we really wanna emphasize that the local needs are so much more important than any review that OPI has made of these curriculum, curricular products, because again, we don't have that information. Every district, every school is gonna have a specific unique set of needs that hopefully is based in data and rooted in data and supported by data. Um, and they're gonna know what their students need and they're gonna be making curriculum, hopefully making curriculum decisions based off of their unique student needs. And that the OPI resources that we've developed with regards to curriculum review, this particular review includes Included, um, are a, just a tool to help support our local curriculum review committees in their selection process. And so um, we hope that, again, that as curriculum committees form and as that curriculum review process is looked at by curriculum um, consortiums or by education partners, that you're looking at some of the work that we've done and that through through a more in-depth, and of course you might wanna take a little extra time on your own outside of this presentation, but through a more in-depth um, perusal of our materials, you'll kind of be able to see our process and see how we came to the various components that we used for um, review. And hopefully see that, for example, um, you know, when we, we were talking about using the What Works Clearinghouse, which is the um, Institute for Educational sciences that um, we were using that as our gold standard for understanding whether or not a program met as a tiers of evidence. Our process was much deeper and broader than that was kind of what we narrowed down to. We looked at some other third party reviews and came to the conclusion that as um, as a review team with our with our capability or capacity, we did not have um, the ability to vet each third party um, independent review of curriculum and as to whether or not it met as a tiers of evidence. So we went with that what was clearinghouse because we know it is vetted. We know that it is the gold standard for whether or not a program of, or curricular materials meets the as a tiers of evidence. And so if a program did not have that as a tiers of evidence, we of course marked it as such on our review rubric. Again, we want that to serve as kind of a learning tool for curriculum review. Um, committees who may feel like they want to look at other third party um, reviews of whether or not a program meets as a tiers of evidence. Similarly with the ed reports, we know we started kind of in our conversations um, and in our review process, we started each conversation with a lot of our schools are going first to ed reports. A lot of our schools when looking at curriculum and, and starting their curriculum review process are starting with ed reports. And it's a great place to start because it is where we see whether or not a program has strong standards alignment. And we have um, we have long since, um, you, um, I guess, um, supported the use of ed reports in curriculum review process because we know that they are a well-designed and vetted by the educational community nationally um, organization that really takes a lot of care in, in looking at curricular resources to see whether or not they are standards aligned and they also assess usability um, and functionality in the classroom. And so that, that ed report, can, we, we knew we could use as a, as a trusted source in our review process. But again, we hope that through the process of looking at this RFI as an example of how curriculum review can go, local education agencies can learn from that and can continue to build, refine, redefine their own local processes. Um, similarly, we talked a little bit about the IMS global standards um, and whether or not a product is certified. And I think Kalei put in the chat that that makes your tech people very happy. Um, so IMS global is, um, uh, houses the case network and they are an organization that has really been doing some exciting work with interoperability for student information systems, curricular materials, um, and, and, and several other aspects of, you know, the teaching and learning, like tech world, but also just like how all of our systems talk to each other, and how data gets recorded, and how that like interacts with curriculum. And so there are some really exciting um, opportunities. So if a program meets, and is certified by MS Global, then that's something that we definitely want to be thinking about and taking into consideration when we're reviewing curriculum. So that's one of the reasons it ended up as one of our preferred program um, require or preferred program features as opposed to like a required component such as the um, 
whether or not it met with the esoteres of evidence per the what works clearinghouse so um I guess I guess what I kind of want to leave you with is that we also hope that through this through looking at our processes and looking at our materials, um, local review teams will save some valuable time in redefining and refining their curriculum review process. Um, we worked on this for months, and we know that there are a lot of ways. I, I love that um, that graphic that Sonia had up on one of her slides that really show that this process can be very convoluted and can take many different turns. And so again, we hope that through looking at our um, our review process and our review results as an example that, again, we can kind of help to start that dialogue and that deliberation and, again, save our local schools some time, either in reviewing the materials that we have already reviewed, or, again, is just using that as a, a like a model for how they will review other curricular materials that might be more specifically um, appropriate for their local needs of their local students. And um, I guess the last thing I want to do is just take you to our K-12 content standards page. Because we this is where everything will live um, for our review materials. Um, you may be very familiar. We hope you are very familiar with this page. Let me get it a little bigger for everybody to see. Um, this is, of course, where you can link to the individual content standards. But as you may and hopefully do well know, we also have some exceptional resources and guidance down here for you in this um, bucket of, of navigation um, materials. And so our instructional materials and best practices uh, live here. This is also where you would find our guide for selecting instructional materials aligned to Montana's content standards. And again, this is where we have um, supported the use of um, ed reports as an example of how you can use third party independent reviews to vet curricular re um, resources prior to adoption and through that uh, as part of your local um, curriculum adoption process. And um, we also include our criteria for selecting instructional materials. So let's take a quick look at both of those. And so the first is a very similar to our RFI um, it has many of the same components that um, you know we asked vendors to be able to speak to in that RFI. And this is how we um, we ask and we hope that our schools are um, considering curriculum as they're looking at that to make sure that it meets um, ESSA, to make sure that it has um, evidence-based research and resources, to make sure that the PD engages educators early and often, and that the process engages educators early and often. Um, and so this is all about how um, uh, again, just a model how schools and local education agencies can go through that process of curriculum review. And we hope that, again, that this review of our RFI materials can be used in collaboration with this existing guidance document for selecting curricular materials um, to just better serve our schools and our kiddos. And the other document here that is, again, very similar and can be used in conjunction with our RFI review materials is this criteria for instruct or for selecting instructional materials. And again, you'll see a lot of overlap, such as are the materials aligned to the Montana content standards? Is there quality Indian education for all embedded in the materials? If not, is there a way to um, embed them through a customizable feature? A lot of the programs that we reviewed did not have Indian education for all. No surprise there, since we are a leader in na nationwide for Indian education for all. And that's something I think Montanans can always be proud of. Um, so it's no surprise that a lot of these uh, corporations um, and these curricular vendors who serve the, the broader national, um, I guess, the broader national um, portrait of American education don't you know, hone in on Indian education for all. We did see a couple of vendors who had um, aspects or features within their curriculum that supported Indian education for all in a loose and or um, maybe indirect way, but it was very, um, it was not often that we found one that specifically dealt with Montana Indian education for all essential understandings. And so again, thinking about how can that program or any program that we review be leveraged to um, either allow for teacher customization so that teachers can add in um, our already well-developed instructional materials that have been developed by our Indian education for all community um, of educators, or um, how can they, you know, again, embed resources that they have um, maybe from their local tribe to meet those components of Indian education for all. So again, those were some of the components that we looked at in that review rubric to see whether or not um, a curriculum 
uh, met some of the things that we know are super important and our statutory responsibility, to, such as, you know, do they meet the Montana content standards um, to teach our students. And so I think the very last piece that I want to link you to and to really kind of bring it all together with is, re is our acceleration and evidence-based instruction, just because um, that acceleration piece is so huge um, in both scope one and scope two. And I know it's a, with a big buzzword that everybody was talking about last year, specifically in response to pandemic learning needs. And as a result of it becoming such a widely touted um, response to pandemic learning needs, I think a lot, I, I know for our team in particular, like what is acceleration became really um, hard to pin down. And so I just wanna remind everybody here or hopefully share with you in case you don't know that we do have um, an acceleration and evidence-based instruction page as well as a guide to planning and implementing acceleration. So this is our one pager. And then we have a whole page dedicated to helping people in the field and our local education agencies, specifically curriculum, in this case, specifically curriculum review committees, understand what acceleration is and is not and understand how they can um, assess whether or not a program or a study, a program um, th such as the ones that the five vendors gave to us to review, um, meets acceleration, whether or not it actually is acceleration or veers more toward the remediation approach. And so we hope that you will utilize all of these resources, again, when looking at selecting curriculum materials and to better understand our review process of the 26 products by the five vendors who responded to our RFI. And I think that is what I have for now. And I think we're ready for some questions and answers. Thank you. I, I just want to say first, Michelle, Stephanie, and Sonia, um, they literally spent the months between October and now digging in, um, you know, refining that process of review and really thinking about how we could share this information in a way that made it useful to districts as they made decisions. So I just want to say thank you, thank you, thank you to them for all of the hard work, the many, many hours that they spent. Um, but absolutely, uh, let's please, um, you know, take yourself off the mute button um, and let us know what questions you have and or feedback. Hi, Kim. Um, I was trying to wait to see if anybody else was going to jump on here, so I wasn't but nobody's unmuted. So first of all, thank you, ladies. Obviously, a great deal of time and effort in this. And it's interesting timing because just this week, Weibo, one of our member districts, uh, has asked me to check around the consortium and find out what folks are using for math textbooks. So this is perfect timing for me to share this with the Weibo administrators. So what's the easiest way for me to get this out to all 31 districts? Do you have a packaged explanatory statement that I can copy and paste in an email and then put these attachments on? Or how do you recommend we disseminate this? So I know um, the, probably the best way is when the links to the um, all of the documents, each of the reviews, um, and then the summary document, um, when those okay. are posted on that page, all okay. you'll need to do is just copy and paste from that page. Okay. We'll also try to get this into um, an upcoming OPI Compass, but I know that that you know that next Compass that we'd be able to put this into won't be out until the first week of April or last week of March. Um, but as soon as all of the documents are posted or there's a, a direct link, we'll we'll be sharing it here on this page, and then Kim. Um, and, and anyone here, um, you'll have our contact information. If you would just want to ping us and say, hey, will you shoot me the link or the documents as soon as they're ready, then we'd be happy to do that as well. Okay. All right. Great. Good they're time. Very close. They're very close to being ready. They do. We just need one more review to make sure there's no errors. Okay. Oh, and just the saddest thing for me is we didn't find in the vendors that replied nothing that was great science with the new standards. Oh, 
but that's oh. national. That I mean, I know we only had five vendors, but nationally there's okay. Not much for science, okay. except for open Syed. But they're they they haven't been reviewed by Ed Reports yet, but they're in line too. Okay. Now, other questions. Mm -hmm. I know um Tom, yes, we'll definitely get the recording to this session posted. Um, but Mark in Belgrade, Danielle, Corey, Rebecca, Becky, if you have any questions, we'd love to, to have them um, on the record here while we're recording or, or certainly um, you know, use the chat to ask a question too. Or if you'd like us to bring up another, uh, a document for you to look at again too. Um, this, is, this is Rebecca. It's now an okay time. Yeah. Okay. Um, yeah, I've just um, returned to Montana from being international the last 15 years. And before that, I was um, quite involved in Montana education as well as Alaska and a few other places and, and uh, lived on the Fort Belknap. Um, but what I learned internationally is the importance of culture and heritage and relate that to the student's identity. Uh, so I just want us to really uh, assure that, that that's part of how it is presented as it's related to the student's identity and who they are. So thank you. Rebecca, thank you so much for sharing that and for bringing that up. And absolutely, we feel the same way. Um, we know that there's good research to support that to support that in education. Um, and again, I just want to kind of point to the preferred program requirements in the rubric that specifically address whether or not the curriculum meets the unique needs of uh, Montana students. And that can be a wide range of of cultural needs or cultural um, belief systems or you know how that meets I mean, we were we talked often when we were looking at reviewing curriculum materials like does this meet with you know some of our more rural communities and their you know love of snowshoeing you know or their love of four-wheeling right like i try to think about like what does what brings us together as montanans what what but builds a part of our culture. And are there opportunities again for teachers to build that customization in so that they have materials that, you know, like, oh, this is all about something that, you know, my zoos, like we don't have a lot of zoos in Montana. In fact, I don't know that we have a single one, right? <laughs> but could they take that lesson and then customize it so that it's about elk and wolves, right? Because that's something that is near and dear to our hearts in Montana, it's part of our culture. So obviously we're looking yes. for IFA piece, but yeah, how, how does that absolutely relate to our students? our student schema, right? Like we want to know that and that's part of our review process. And again, we hope that that is something that is echoed in the local control, um, the local communities um, review of curriculum. Yeah, and um, Michelle, I'm, I'm glad you're showing um, kind of the list of the links. So Kim, that's kind of, kind of will get to answering your question as well of the kind of the depth of information that's going to be available. Um, I. I think that you're going to find the individual review results tables have those details that are super helpful as district leaders are looking at well you know what's a good thing to buy what what maybe isn't a good thing to buy. Um, a couple of other things I, I was just going to mention too that are that are part of the review. Um, we asked vendors to say whether they were licensed to do business in Montana. Um, and textbooks, um, our laws about textbooks changed in the last legislative session. And so they include digital materials. Um, so there is a very short list. Some of the, the respondents that we um, heard from are on the list of licensed and bonded textbook vendors in Montana. Um, and that's really important for you on a couple of fronts. One, it gives gives districts the protection um, if they're not satisfied with a product um, and recourse um, if they aren't satisfied. The other part of that, which is it's a little bit separate, but in, equally as important is we're really talking about digital materials. 
resources that are, are able to be used in student information systems, in remote learning, or uh, different types of learning environments. And so this, the privacy of student data and our Montana laws around student uh, privacy agreements and that were another component that we asked for. So you'll see specifically, are they licensed and bonded in Montana? Yes or no. Do they already, um, are, are they already uh, part of the Student Privacy Data Alliance and do they have those, those agreements in place for districts? Again, that's another matter of, of convenience and saving time as districts look at potential purchases of, of materials with our BESSER funds. Thank you, Mark, very much. It's great to hear from you. Well, I think, um, again, I want to thank everybody for spending this time with us this afternoon. We want to uh, honor everybody's time um, and definitely make the offer to be in touch. We'll, we'll put the kind of the group email um, in the chat here. Um, if you want to send any questions our way and we'll get all of the information posted to the webpage that Stephanie showed you very shortly and we'll reach back out um, with the links as they're available.